is risen. Three small words that brought the collective pace of humanity to an absolute standstill. He is risen. Three words that shattered prisons. Words that shook the earth's foundations. Words that transformed a sense of utter despair into cries of pure joy and ecstasy. Echoes of history's greatest triumph that still shape our reality. Even today, we're assaulted by constant distraction, countless sources waging war for our attention, yet three words pierce the noise. In our hunger for validation, our desperate pleas for love and attention, three words calm our anxieties. In a universe spinning at breakneck speed, its inhabitants locked in an existential crisis, three words proclaim the purpose of our existence. He is risen. Lay hold of this truth and embrace the peace within. Yesterday, fear reigned in our hearts. Yesterday, we sat in crippling darkness. Yesterday, we suffered abuse and all the accusations of a broken world. But today, our king, our healer, our defender is risen. And this reality doesn't merely accompany us on a meaningless journey. This changes everything. For you see, if he is risen, then all other pursuits become secondary. All of our failures become insignificant. All criticisms and condemnations become irrelevant. There is only his word, his mission, and his infinite, unconditional love for you. Because he is risen, we look to tomorrow. Tomorrow we will stop defining our worth through status and social media. Tomorrow we will together build an everlasting kingdom. Tomorrow and every day after, we will dance in the radiance of a redeeming savior who crushed death and set us free. There is nothing that Jesus cannot overcome. We know this because he lives. We know this because he is risen. Well, happy Easter. That's a beautiful um, spoken word about the truth of why we are worshiping him this morning. And so today, wherever you are, let's not forget that we have joy in worshiping our risen Savior this morning. So we always usually start our Easter service with this. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. So let's just lift our voice in joy to the Lord this morning. We worship you today, Father. Hallelujah. Come, let us worship our King. Come, let us bow at his feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See how his love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh, God. You have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh, God, you have done great things. Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. You've been faithful through every storm. You'll be faithful forevermore. You have done great promises yes and amen you will do great things god you do great things oh hero of heaven you conquered the grave you free every captive and break every chain
chain, oh God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high, oh God, you have done great things. Oh hero of heaven, you conquered the grave. You free every captive and break every chain, oh God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high, oh God, you have done great things. Hallelujah, God, above it all, hallelujah, God, unshakable, hallelujah, you have done great things. We lift your name this morning, Lord. Hallelujah, God, above it all. Hallelujah, God, unshakable. Hallelujah, you have done great things. Let's declare it in our worship today. Hallelujah, God, above it all. Hallelujah, God, unshakable. grave you free every captive and break every chain oh god you have done great things we dance in your freedom awake and alive oh jesus our savior your name lifted high oh god you have done great things oh hero of heaven you conquered the grave you free every captive and break every chain oh god you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh, God, you have done great things. God, you do great things. Oh, God, you do great things. Yes, Lord, we lift your name on high this morning. Hallelujah, we worship you and exalt you, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And Father, we thank you that as we stand in this place, that we, we can stand assured, Lord, you, that, that you are faithful, that you never change, you're the God who's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And because, Lord, of this great gift that you've given us of your resurrection, of your, of your death and your life. Lord, we have hope for an eternity with you. And so this morning, Lord, we just recite those things and declare those truths to you because you are our victorious King and our Holy Father. We worship you this morning, Jesus. stars they wept the morning sun was dead the savior of the world was fallen his body on the cross his blood poured out for us the weight of every curse upon him Final breath he gave as heaven looked away. The Son of God was laid in darkness. A battle in the grave, the war on death was waged. The power of hell forever broken. And the ground began to shake. The stone was rolled away, his perfect love could not be overcome. Now death, where is your sting? Our resurrected King has 
has rendered you defeated forever he is glorified forever he is lifted high forever he is risen he is alive and he is alive and the ground began to shake the stone was rolled away his perfect love could not be overcome now death where is your sting our resurrected king has rendered you defeated forever he is glorified forever he is lifted high forever he is risen he is alive yes he is alive
redemption written on his hands. Jesus, you will reign forevermore. The victory is yours. You reign forevermore. The victory is yours. You reign forevermore. The victory is yours. Yes, Father, the victory is yours today. So we're going to continue to worship this morning um, through the celebration of the Lord's Supper together. I can't think of a better day to, to um, gather together around the Lord's table than on Easter Sunday. Because because communion is designed for us to remember who Jesus is and what he's done. And The Apostle Paul wrote about that for us as he wrote to the Corinthian church. When he said this in chapter 11 of 1 Corinthians, he said, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread. When he given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But a man must examine himself, and in so doing, he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Look what the Apostle Paul said to us. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so that's, that's talking about the fact that death did not hold Jesus down. That his death until he comes speaks of, of Easter Sunday. Until he comes is Resurrection Sunday. And so when we gather today around the communion table, all of you in your different places, in your homes, we gather together, what we're doing is we're saying, we, we celebrate until he comes. We celebrate the fact that he is alive, that Jesus is alive. That as we, the worship team said, he is risen. He is risen indeed. Communion is all about he is risen indeed. And so today, as we do that, we, we take the bread and the cup. And at our church, when we celebrate communion together, we, um, we do our best to, to follow what the Apostle Paul wrote here. He said, take the bread, take the cup, take the wine, and for us, juice. And then before you'd partake, let a person, it says a man, so a man or a woman, examine himself and in so doing, he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. And what are we examining ourselves for? What are we do? What's that mean? Well, I think there's really two ways that that applies to us. The first way we examine ourselves is that if, if we are a um, person who knows they're in a right relationship with God. We've come to Christ as our Savior and Lord. We've given our lives to Christ. We've, but the Bible talks about repenting. We, we're living one way with, with our living our own self-willed life. And then we recognize that, you know what, in this kingdom that we live in, the kingdom of God, there's a true king and his name is Jesus. And we say, you know what, Jesus, I want you to be king of my life. I want you to be Lord of my life. And we say repentance means I recognize the fact that Jesus is Lord and that recognition has a change of heart. I'm not Lord anymore. I don't want to be Lord anymore. I want him to be Lord in my life. And I change direction. I say now I want to walk in my life following after you, Jesus. And a lot of us have done that. A lot of you watching today have done that as you celebrate Easter. Easter Sunday to you is celebrating your risen Lord. And so if that's you... We examine ourselves in a way of saying this, Lord, as I'm walking with you, am I really walking in step with you? Am I walk, living out my life um, daily where you really are, Lord, where you really are king? And I'm following after you with my life. And if you find out, as you do a self-examination of that, and you find out that, that you're not what you do, you say, Lord, I want to change. I want to repent again. I want to change direction again. And we change direction so we walk lockstep with Jesus. So the first way that we examine ourselves on this Easter Sunday morning is we ask if we know the Lord, Lord, am I really living the life 
in union with you that you want me to live. And then if we find that we're straying, we come back to the Lord. So the second way, though, that we examine ourselves is maybe you're listening today and you're in your living room or you're in your bedroom or you're, you're uh, listening to this on a podcast as you're, as you're um, driving in a car and you could say about yourself, you know this, you know that you're not in a right relationship with the Lord. It's Resurrection Sunday and you're like, what's that all about? And you say, you know what, I'm not in a right relationship with Jesus. Well, we examine ourselves and we come to that conclusion that no, I'm not. And so we say, but yes, I want to be. And we say yes to Jesus. We say, Jesus, I want you to be Lord of my life. I want you to be Savior, the one who washes away my sins. And so on this Easter Sunday 2020, I'm going to ask you to come into my life. And I ask you to make me a brand new person from the inside out. And from this day forward, I want to walk with you as my Savior and my Lord. You can do that today. As we celebrate communion together, you can do that today. And I think that's one of the reasons that God gave us um, for, for communion, gave us tangible elements. He gave us things we can hold in our hands. He gave us a, a piece of bread as a symbol, symbol of his body and, and um, juice or wine as a, as a symbol. We can look at it. It looks like his shed blood so that it becomes very real in this moment. And we say, Lord, you know what? When I say yes to you, I'm really saying yes to you. I'm, I'm tangibly doing something. I'm, I'm welcoming you into my life. And so we're going to take communion together and say yes to the Lord all of us. Yes, I want to walk with you if I know you, and yes, I want to receive you if I don't yet, but I want to know you right now in my life. So take that piece of bread out. Hold it in your hand. Recognize that, that Jesus said he took the bread and he broke it and he gave it to, to his disciples and said, take this, all of you, and eat it, you know, in remembrance of me. So today, what do we remember about Jesus? We remember that he's alive. Easter Sunday, we remember that, that the grave couldn't hold him and that Jesus is alive, and that we're going to welcome the reality of the risen, living Savior into our lives to do inside of us what only He can do, to renew and make us new, to change us from the inside out. So let's take the bread. Jesus, we thank You for Your broken body, and now we want to welcome You in all of Your strength and all of Your power to do all You can do inside our lives because of who you are. Let's partake of the bread together. The Apostle Paul said that Jesus said that the cup is a new covenant in his blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of Jesus. And so what do we remember about, what else do we remember about Jesus today? Well, we remember by looking at the fact that the, 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 the wine or juice represents his shed blood, we recognize that he laid it all out for us. We just celebrate that on Good Friday. He gave it all. We also recognize that his strength and his power, the risen Savior, is available in our lives today. The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you, the scriptures say, if Jesus is in you. And so what we do at communion, when we, when we think of the shed blood of Christ, is we think of the power of God to, do, to bring change and health and wholeness and healing and deliverance and freedom into our lives. So you know what's in your life that needs to have Jesus touch it. You know what's, what's between you and the Lord, what's, what's standing there, what you've been holding out to him and saying, God, help me or, 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 or minister to me or heal me. And in this moment, Easter Sunday, when we remember the fact that Jesus is alive, we're going to invite the risen Savior to come and to touch us in ways that only He can, to, to heal our hearts and heal our bodies, heal our broken relationships, provide for our every need. So Jesus, we hold in our hands this reality of your shed blood. And Lord, now we invite you into our hearts, into our lives, in a new and a fresh way, on this Easter Sunday, risen Savior, do what only you can do in our lives. Heal, touch, transform, all for your glory. In Jesus' name, let's partake together.
Praise the Lord. Celebrating communion together on Easter Sunday. Why? Because he is risen. He is risen indeed. You know what? If you're at your house right now, look at somebody across the room and say that to him. Say, he is risen. He is risen indeed. And even if you're alone, say it. Say it to the cat or the dog or say it to whomever. To yourself. Remind yourself the truth. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Well, on this Easter Sunday, 2020, I want to um, I want to thank you as a church family. Um, you know, we've been in this crazy coronavirus, you know, um, pandemic now for a number of weeks, and we've not been able to join together at church. and And I just want to thank you for how faithful you have been in so many ways. You've been faithful in um, communicating with the church, faithful in in um, encouraging us as we've been trying to encourage you. Thank you for that. We're really glad to hear that. I get cards and letters like every day from somebody or text messages or phone calls almost every day. Thank you for that encouragement um, and saying how much you appreciate what the staff is doing, putting these services together and, and just reaching out the, the Good Friday um, uh, thing that we mailed you with the little cross and the questions. And, and uh, we're doing our best to stay connected and keep on um, ministering to you. So, so thank you that you've been reaching out also. And I also want to thank you for your generosity um, in giving. That, you know, the ministries of the church um, have not gone down, they've gone up. Um, we still have our, our normal ministries, but now we are helping people who are in, in crisis. And we're also having the normal bills of the church. And you guys have been crazy generous uh, towards Portview Church, and I want to thank you for it. Just this last week. Um, Suzanne and I were able to go and deliver groceries to a number of different families who um, were either in need, like there's a financial reason, or they just couldn't get out of the house because of, of uh, other health issues in their life. And so we were able to, because of the Church of Generosity, go buy, buy groceries and deliver them to homes. And we were also, this last week, able to help two different pastors that are struggling financially because their churches are struggling financially. Um, one was a local pastor, but I want to tell you just briefly about another one. I don't want to say his name, but in a city about a, an hour away from here, I'd shared with our superintendent, uh, John Davis, um, that, that our church has this ministry called Passion for Pastors and how we love to help pastors. And I just told this quite a while ago, and, and when the whole coronavirus thing um, broke out, I sent him a text and said, hey, remember, if people need help, let us know. So he called me this last week, and he told me about a, about a church in our district, a pastor in our district, and, and I had actually been aware of the need and been praying, should we help that particular pastor? And he called me up and he said, Mark, you think Portview Church could give X amount of dollars to that pastor? And I was, it was, I was excited because, number one, we had the money. But number two, myself and our staff had been praying and asked the Lord, do you want us to help this particular pastor because we have been, been made aware of the need? And so I immediately contacted Pastor Mitch and said, hey, send the check out for this amount to this guy in this city. And um, it was so fun to be able to help somebody in need. And how can we do that? Only because of your generosity. And so thank you um, for your crazy generosity. Also, a number of you have been sending money in specifically for COVID um, needs. And um, just specifically saying that. So we have a, spe a separate spot on our app and our, our um, website where you can give directly to that. And um, so thank you for that. Anything you give in, 100% of it, we're going to give out and as needs continue to arise. But another way that we're going to give out as a church is we've been in contact with the three main food pantries in our area. Uh, there's one in Port, one in Sockville, one in Grafton. And um, we've been in contact saying, you know, what needs do you have? And what they've done is they all kind of said the same thing. Everybody, you know, hoarded everything and bought everything, and it kind of cleaned out the shelves of the, of the stores. And a lot of that stuff on the sh store shelves, when it would get near expiration, would be donated to them. But because everybody bought everything, their donations are way down. And so what we're going to ask Portview Church to do, our crazy, generous Portview family, is, is really two things. Number one, um, starting today, it's Sunday morning, Easter Sunday, we're going to have our shopping cart that we usually use in our cafe to collect different things for different outreaches and stuff. That's going to be out um, at the front entrance of the church under the overhang. And on, on our website, and it was put on Facebook yesterday also, there is a list of items that the food pantry is specifically asking for. And we're going to ask you to do this. Go in your pantry in your house, and if you've got any of those items and you can spare them, 
bring them over, just throw them in that basket, and every day we'll be taking those out of the basket and putting them in boxes and bringing them inside the church, and then we'll, we'll be dropping those off at the various food pantries. And if you don't want to do that, um, or maybe even when you're shopping, your normal shopping, I know we're really restricted, we're not asking you to go shopping specially for this. We don't want you to just go to the store just for this. But if you're going to do your regular shopping, you can take that list and purchase some of those items and drop those off in the, in the basket at the church. If you don't want to do it that way, you can just give on our app or our website to the coronavirus um, tab, and we will take money from there, and we will send somebody to Costco or someplace. And I've actually been in contact with somebody about trying to get a, some cheaper things through some stores, um, and we will buy um, items and then donate them to the food pantry and then ask them also if they just want additional money. So um, we can have a chance to make a real significant impact in our community by giving to, the, to this um, food pantry outreach financially and with donations. And so we're looking forward to um, being able to do that over the next couple of weeks. So we're really, we're really excited that um, we're getting to do that. And we get to show the community um, that Portview Church is what? I heard you. People who care. I can hear you all the way here at church. People who care. And uh, you guys are proving that, so thank you immensely um, for being such a great church family. Now, speaking of our church family, I want to have a couple of our beautiful young girls via video um, share some cuteness with you right now. So watch this video. Happy Easter! This is a reading from Matthew 28, 1 through 10, the Resurrection. Early on Sunday morning, when new day was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to visit the tomb. Suddenly, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, rolled aside the stone, and sat on it. His face shone like lightning, and his clothing was white as snow. The guard shook with fear when they saw him and fell to a dead faint. Then they spoke to the woman, Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid, he said. I know you are looking for Jesus. He was crucified. He isn't here. He has risen from the dead, just like he said would happen. Come see where the body was lying. And now go quickly and tell his disciples, that he has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there. Remember what I have told you. The women ran quickly. They were frightened, but also filled with joy. And they rushed to give the disciples the angel's message. As they went, Jesus met them and greeted them. They ran to him, grabbed his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said, Don't be afraid. Go Go tell my brothers to leave for Galilee, and you will see me there. I told you that we we're going to add some cuteness um, to our service. So thank you so much, Ellie, uh, Ellie and Sophia, for, for reading uh, the Easter message story to us today. Safely from your homes, I must add. Um, but thank you so much for doing that and helping us feel a little bit more like um, Easter. Normally at our Easter services, we'd have some cute little things of kids singing songs and, and different stuff and with our children. And so I figured our kids, we needed to have something from our, from our wonderful Portview kids in our service today. So thank you so much for, for uh, giving us that little um, bit of joy this morning. And so um, it's awesome. So I'd say again, happy, unusual Easter. I think this is going to go down in the books as that, right? Happy, unusual Easter. And although we're not together physically, um, think of this. We are joining with hundreds of millions, probably in excess of one billion other Christians this morning declaring Jesus is risen. You know, Christianity is the largest religion on the planet, and so there's over a billion Christians. So over a billion people probably today are saying Jesus is alive, celebrating. What else in the history of humanity could ever say such a thing? A billion people over that at one time in one day are saying 
Jesus is alive. Jesus is our ever-present Savior. And so, friends, the, the aliveness of Jesus that we remember, we celebrate on Easter, it reminds me of something. And when I term this, this term that maybe is kind of a made-up term, but it reminds us of the nowness of God, that Jesus is right here, right now. Why? Because He is alive. That He is as real and present and alive and living in your living room or your kitchen or maybe you're sitting in your bedroom as He is when we're gathered together in church at Port View on Sunday morning. Now, there's uniqueness when we're gathered together, and there's, there's something I long for with that. There's, a, there's, a, there's a, a power of His presence that is real when we're gathered. But He says this, when two or three gather in my name, He's with us in a special way. So I'd have to say, we're gathering in His name today because we would rather be here we're not just trying to say, hey, I wish I was in that church. We're saying, I want to be here, but you know what? The, the greatest way we can do that right now, the best way we can do that is we can gather together um, through our social media. And so he is now with us. The nowness of God is here. And that's what Easter reminds us of. So I just say again, happy Easter, happy resurrection morning, knowing that your Savior is alive and well and his presence dwells with you today. So now, Ellie and Sophia already read for us this Easter morning the story of the, of the resurrection from the gospel of Matthew on how Mary Magdalene, and it says the other Mary. How would you like to be referred to as that? You're just the other Mary, you know, the other Mark, the other Mitch. Um, but Mary Magdalene and the other Mary arrived at the tomb and encountered an angel and then found fainted soldiers and then found an empty tomb, and then they met Jesus alive. You know, what an amazing story they just read. And what I want to do for our Easter message today is I want to take that a little bit further. I want to go a little bit past that today, and I want us to look at what, instead of what uh, Matthew's gospel said, what John's gospel has to say about that interaction that Jesus and Mary Magdalene had at the empty tomb. I want us to say, that was a great story saying this is all happened, but, but John gives additional information. And he says, okay, and this is a little side, a little side show, a little sidelight. This is what happened between Jesus and Mary Magdalene on that morning at the empty tomb. So grab your Bible. You should have it right there, right? It's on your coffee table or it's somewhere. Um, grab your Bible out. You know, you don't bring your Bible to church. You got to have it at home. So take that thing out. Um, yeah, I mean, so I say you bring your phones to church, but... You might start after this bringing your real Bible to church um, if you want. But John chapter 20, turn there. They give you enough time to find it. We're going to start reading in verse 11, okay? John 20, verse 11. But Mary was standing outside the tomb weeping. And so as she wept, she stooped and looked into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and one at the feet, where the body of Jesus had been lying. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. And when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom do you seek? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. And Jesus said to her, Stop clinging to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I ascend to my Father and your Father, my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene came, announcing to the disciples, I have seen the Lord and that he has said these things to me. Now notice something with me as we, as we read this together today, as we read it together today. That, that there are three distinct statements that John makes to Mary Magdalene during this encounter. And if you have a red letter edition Bible, and, and you don't have to have that at all, but if you do, like I do, um, what it does is it, it highlights 
the, the words that Jesus said, that are recorded from Jesus saying, in red, so they kind of stand out. So as I look at, at my, um, my Bible in, in this chapter, chapter 20, there's three distinct sections that are highlighted in red in the midst of it. Well, those are the three statements that Jesus makes to Mary. And we know this. Those are three statements that are directed to a unique person called Mary Magdalene on Resurrection Sunday, three days after Jesus had been crucified, and it was for her on that day in that situation. But we also realize something like this, or something like this, that as Jesus spoke to Mary, the things that he said to her, I really believe reveals how he feels about all people. Yes, he addressed them to Mary, but the way he addresses the things that we do, we could take and say, now he says that he feels that way towards Mary or acts that way towards Mary, and this really is also how he feels and acts towards all people because he doesn't just love Mary, he loves anyone. And I think what we see in the interaction between Jesus and Mary Magdalene is we see the heart of Jesus towards an, for, as an interaction towards Jesus and any one of us, towards you or towards me. So what I want to do this Easter Sunday is I want to look at these three statements and see what the scriptures are saying about how Jesus feels and, that, and, and acts towards you and me today. Because it's how he felt and acted towards Mary, and I think he has the same heart for every single one of us. So let's look at these three statements. The first one is in verse 15. And it's, it's interesting. It says, woman, and it's funny, Jesus calls Mary woman when he knows her, but woman, why are you weeping? And we'll figure this out in a second why he says that. And whom are you seeking? Now, ask yourself a question. Do you think that Jesus didn't know who Mary was? He doesn't call her by name there. He doesn't know why she's weeping, and he doesn't know who she's seeking. Well, of course he did. Of course he knew the answers to all that. He knew that, that Mary had come to the tomb to prepare his body for burial because he was supposed to be dead. He knew that she was weeping because she had seen him crucified and had seen his body taken off the cross and laid in a tomb, and now she's there, and she thinks his body has been snatched by somebody, at least that's what she thought, and she's weeping, and she's saying, where have they laid my Lord? So here was Mary, alone and stressed and sad, because that would have been exactly how she felt and maybe magnify that by a 1,000 or 100,000. And Jesus asks her, why? Why? I want us to think about that. Sometimes we pass right over those things and we don't give time to let it sink in. Why would these things happen? So why do we think Jesus did that? I believe it's a really clear answer. I believe it's because Jesus wanted to help Mary be honest with herself. He wanted her to look at her situation, and he wanted her to be honest with how she felt and what she really wanted. I think what he wanted her to do is he wanted to say out loud, he wanted her to name what her need was and what her desire was. He was saying this, he wanted her to say, this is how I feel, and this is what I want. And you think, why would Jesus do that? Here's why I think. Because you and me are really good fakers. We're really good pretenders. Someone asks you, hey, you know, how are you doing this morning during the situation? It could be the, how are you doing with COVID-19? And what's most everybody say? You know, hey, just doing great, wonderful, or whatever other struggles going on in your life. Our general response is, well, I'm fine, oh, no problem, no worries. And it's the kind of stuff that we say all the time. But the question is, is that really true? It could be true, and I hope it's true, but is it really true? And I think what Jesus is doing here is he's, he's giving us permission to just be gut honest with him, to tell him the truth about our struggles and our hurts and our fears, that he wants us to be honest. And why would he want us to be honest? Because he knows that that's the first step towards our healing and our health. Until I can say to him, Jesus, this is what I'm feeling, this is what I'm looking for, and I can name it, I don't usually know what it is, and how can it be, how can it be healed? And he wants us to be able to name 
our hurts and our desires and our, and our desires and our wants, to name them before him so that he can, we can bring them to him. You say, well, that seems odd. It's not odd at all. If you read the Psalms, and I hope you do, matter of fact, here's what I found with most people, that when they first come to Christ, the Psalms generally aren't that important to them. But the longer they walk with the Lord, the more the Psalms become important. So now, the Psalms are, for me, are part of my every single day, um, or almost every single day, um, time with the Lord. And if you think of the Psalms, and particularly of David, but not just David, there's other psalmists, um, we see that they do what Jesus is asking Mary to do here all the time. He, the, the psalmist will pour out his heart before God. He's completely honest with his feelings before God. And that's why I think so many times we love the Psalms, because it gives us permission to be completely honest. Matter of fact, in the Psalms, um, sometimes we're actually uncomfortable with just how honest with his feelings the psalmist can be. You know, saying crazy things like, say, smash all the people's heads, against, all my enemies' heads against the rocks. And we look at it and go, how could you say that? And some people mistake and say, well, God is saying you should do that. No, the psalmist is just saying, this is how I feel. It's not right, but this is how I feel. And he's encouraging us. He's exa- giving us an example to say, it's, it's not only all right, it's right to be gut honest with God. Jesus is inviting us to be honest with him. He can handle it. He knows how important it is for your spiritual and your physical health. So think about during this time right now where there's a lot of fear in our world. God wants you to be honest with him. He wants you to tell him how you're feeling and don't hide that. Don't gloss it over. Get with the Lord and tell him, this is how I'm feeling so that he can bring healing into your life. Because here's the deal. He cares about you and he cares about your situation. So tell Jesus how you feel. Tell him what you long for because he cares for you. And that's what we, that's what we see what he's doing in the situation with Mary and his encounter with her at the tomb. So that's the first thing. The first statement that Jesus makes to Mary, woman, why are you weeping and whom are you seeking? And that leads then into the, the second statement. And the second statement that Jesus makes is, is only one word. It's her name. What's he say? Mary. And I love this. It's Mary exclamation point. So she's saying all stuff, and I think he just goes, Mary, to get her attention. Mary. And he says her name. Let me think, think about something with me this morning. Why do you, you know, why, why don't, um, or we don't know, I should say this rather, why in the beginning of the encounter, Mary couldn't recognize Jesus? Um, and assumed that he was the gardener. The same way we, we don't really know why the two men on the road to Emmaus didn't know Jesus as they walked with him right after, the res- right after his death on the cross and resurrection. They didn't know who he was. And he's walking and he's telling them the scriptures. And then later they said, oh, when we, when we broke bread, then we recognized who he was. We don't know why um, Mary couldn't recognize Jesus. But we know that Mary knew Jesus really well. She was one of his closest followers. And that um, here she's talking to him, but she doesn't know who he is until he says her name. And I think it's important. I think on purpose, the Spirit inspired John to include this detail in here, that the way she recognized him is when he said Mary. When he said her name. When he said her name, that's when she... Somehow the blinders were removed, and she knew who he was. And we ask, what can we learn from this encounter that Mary had with Jesus? Well, we can simply know this, and then we'll talk about the results of it. Jesus knows your name. Jesus knows your name. In other words, this, he knows you personally, and he cares about you personally. You know, one of the best-known verses in all the Bible, and I, I actually think we just, we just referenced it on, on uh, um, Good Friday, is, is John 3.16, where it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him would not perish but would have everlasting life. Now think about this. Often we are all right saying, For God so loved the world. We're not so, that's, not such, that's not very uncomfortable. For God so loved the world, and we have that idea about God, yeah, he loves the world. But I know at times in my life, and I know because of all the people I've talked to over 30 years as a pastor, 
that a lot of times it's hard for someone to say, for God so loved me. It's hard to believe that for God so loved me, for God so loved you. It's just hard to believe. And you know why it's hard to believe is because I know me. And I know you. I know things about me that you don't know. And you know things about you that you don't know. And we know this, God knows it. And we know that it's, we think, I should say, that how could God, how could I really say for God so loves me because God knows the real me. But what we find here is that for God so loved me that he gave his only begotten son. And my thought for you this Easter Sunday morning is can you say that? Can you say that in your, in your living room right now or your bedroom or wherever you're at? Can you say for God so loved Mark that he gave his only begotten son or you know, whatever your name is, for God so loved Mary, Sally, Jan, for God so loved you that he gave his only begotten son. I think what he's trying to show us in this text is that God knows your name, that this Easter God is, is intimately acquainted with you, and I would say this, even if you've been running from him for year after year after year, and you know if you have been. You can go to church every, every single week and still run from God. You can have divorced yourself from the church years ago and be, know you're running from God. But God is intimately acquainted with you and loves you and knows your name even if you're running away from him. And listen, if you don't have a real relationship with him, he wants you to. He knows your name and he wants to be in an intimate level, an intimate relationship with you. You know, every... Every Easter, millions, and we said today probably a billion people go to church. Maybe they don't all go to church, but that many people. Millions and millions and tens of millions and hundreds of millions go to church because it's some kind of religious obligation. There's no real living personal connection between them and Jesus. It's kind of about, yeah, yeah, God loves the world, impersonal, and I need to go because family, friends, whatever culture says, I need to go. But today, Jesus is calling your name. He's calling your name. He's saying, like he said at the tomb that day, Mary or Mark or Jill or Tracy or whoever you are, he's calling your name. He knows your name, and he's calling you by name to come into his family, to come back into his family. That tugging that you feel at your heart right now, which, which you can know this, is not manipulation because you're not in the church building and saying, oh, I got all the trappings of the church. It's just you listening to me and you're sitting in your couch. And that, that, that tug you feel in your heart right now that's saying, this is for me, that feeling is the Spirit of God tugging at your heart and calling you by name. Not just for God so loved the world, but God so loved Bill or whatever your name is. That feeling inside is the Spirit of God tugging at you. So this Easter Sunday, there's not a better time ever to say yes to the risen Savior who's alive today. He knows you, he loves you, and he died on the cross and rose from the dead. For who? For the world? Yeah, but for you and for me. So this Easter morning is a day you can welcome Jesus into your life and have him become, because it's his desire, your Savior and your Lord and live your days under his umbrella of provision and protection, his rule and his reign, because that's his plan for every single person on planet Earth, that everyone would know him. And that's why we celebrate today. So, now there's one more statement that Jesus made to Mary on that morning, and I want us to look at it this morning before we're done. Look at verse 17. Jesus said, stop clinging to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I ascend to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Look at this. Jesus had to tell Mary, and it's very interesting. People, scholars dis disagree on what this could mean. It's kind of problematic, but I don't think really think it's problematic at all. I think, you know, Jesus has to look at Mary and he says, let go of me. He was alive from the grave and he was in the process of ascending to the right hand of the Father, which he would do shortly. But I think he's saying this, but there was stuff to do. And he tells Mary, you go do this. He's saying kind of like this, hey, let go of me. I know you just want to sit here and worship me, but let go of me. We got stuff to get done. We've got stuff to do. And so what does 
what, um, what was she to do? She was to go and to tell um, that, that, he had a, that he ascends, he said, that I'm ascending, that I'm alive, I'm not in the grave anymore. I ascend, and he was ascending, he says, to my father and your father, to my God and your God. And I think there's two things that really need to be seen from this statement. And the first one is what we've been focusing on along this morning. He says, I ascend. He's saying, I'm not dead. I'm not in a grave somewhere. I am alive. And friends, this is the heart of the Christian message. We're unlike any other religion that's ever been conceived because all the other religions are conceived by man, but this is God's way. Christianity is God's way of reaching humanity. We're unlike any other religion because we serve a living Savior. That's what sets Christianity apart. We don't follow a list of rules and doctrines. We follow and worship our living Savior, Jesus Christ, who is part of the eternal Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. That's who we serve. He's alive in relationship as a Trinity and invites us into the relationship with the Trinity because he is alive. And what he's saying here is, and when you know that, you need to go and tell everybody that you meet, Jesus is alive. So that's the first thing we see from this. And the second thing we see is this from the statement is that Jesus describes uh, how Jesus describes God the Father. He says, I go to my Father and your Father, my God and your God. You thought, you know, again, these are the kind of things you can read over, but you have to say, why would he have said it like that? Why would he have said, my God and your God, my Father and your Father? Because he's trying to emphasize something here. He's trying to em emphasize the inclusive nature of God. God is my God and God is your God. God is my Father and God is your Father. God is my God. God can be your God. My God, He's my God, my Father, and He can be your Father. He's talking about being inclusive. And think about something so unique this Easter that's never happened before ever in the history of the world. On a Sunday that we are not allowed to meet in churches, and think about this, the churches that usually separate followers of Jesus, you go to this church and they go to that church and somebody's in another church, these churches are churches that usually separate those who follow Jesus into distinct groups on, on any Sunday, but on Easter Sunday, that on this Sunday, this Easter Sunday, it's time for us to Focus on what unites us, what we have in common. That he is my God and he's your God. He's my father and he's your father. That if you are a Baptist or you are an Episcopalian or you're a Methodist or a Catholic or you're part of the Assemblies of God like we are, that we serve a risen Savior. That he is our father who art in heaven. That he is our God today. On Easter Sunday. That's what I think Jesus is trying to get across here. Easter should unify the family of God. And I love a quote from, from Augustine. Augustine said this, he said, at least it's, a, it's attributed to him. In essentials, unity. In doubtful matters, liberty. In all things, charity. In essentials, unity. In doubtful matters, liberty. In all things, charity. And I think that's a great motto for the church today. Wouldn't it be great if the result of this unusual Easter, where we can't be divided by separate church buildings, is that we could recognize that we are all together in the same situation. We're not, none of us are allowed to go to church. We're all really unified. We're unified in a, in a pandemic where we're isolated, but we're not. We're unified by the fact that we are followers of Jesus. Imagine that. The situation that's meant to divide us actually unifies us. That we are united on the essentials. Christ is risen. Christ is Lord. Christ is Savior. And that we would, we would give then charity or love towards those who see things a little bit differently than we do. I would have to believe it would thrill the heart of God if what happened out of this Easter when we were separated is we actually realized that we're united. That we're not, we don't have to be the Assemblies of God and the Catholics and the Methodists and the Lutherans. We can be the children of God. And we can be united. 
by God. Yes, we have distinctions, and that's all right. But let's, let's understand that we can be united in Christ, one faith, one baptism, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. So what can we learn this Easter Sunday from Mary's experience with Jesus on Easter Sunday morning? He cares about your situation. He knows your name, and he opens his kingdom to everyone and anyone who will say yes to the risen Savior. We talked about it earlier today in the message, at communion in the middle of the message, the second point, that maybe on this Easter Sunday you don't know Christ yet, but something's going on in your heart saying, this is for me. Don't let this Easter Sunday go by without seriously saying yes to Jesus. If you need to, get on your knees right now. Open up your heart and say, Jesus, come into my life. I need you. Forgive me. Make me brand new from the inside out. I'm not talking about religion. I'm talking about coming into relationship with the living God of the universe, saying, come into my life. I want to be one with you. And every time somebody says that, he cheers. And he says, yes, I've been waiting for you. That's what Jesus does today. So today, Easter Sunday, a day where we're separated by something, divided by something that could separate us, a pandemic, we're unified in understanding that Jesus is alive and he's now, the nowness of God. Friends, there's no better reason to say happy Easter than that when we come to realize this. I want to close a way that we close very often in our church family here at Portview Church, by praying a blessing over you wherever you find yourself to be today. So let me, let me pray this blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. God bless you, friends. Have a wonderful day celebrating the reality that Jesus is alive.